Well, everybody, welcome and, and thanks again to the GW uh, students for, for helping coordinate with this. Um, today, we've got uh, Dr. Doug Ritchie, and I'm really excited to have him as a guest. He's going to be talking about his um, book that he just put to press. And, um, you know, when I read this book, Doug, I felt like a kid that's uh, walking around the neighborhood and then your family takes you out on a, a car trip, you know, you know your neighborhood and they take you a car trip and you're going from like the other end of town. And then all of a sudden, like things connect like, oh, that's where the plaza is. And that's where, you know, the, the baseball field comes in. And it had that kind of effect with, with the foot because we, we have these hooks that we have with our knowledge, our base knowledge from school and from other conferences. But boy, what an amazing job you did of putting everything together. And uh, I said it in the uh, kind of the press releases that we sent out that I felt and I feel strongly that this is the most significant contribution in the last 10 years. And to check myself, I took a look at some of the things in the last 10 years, and it turns out that Serapian's updated book was in 2011. So <laughs> if you want to be uh, <laughs> sort of head to toe with uh, Serapian, um, it, it was 10 years ago that they updated that book. So I'm gonna let you uh, give the intro to your book. I just want to say that uh, Dr. Ritchie is a past uh, uh, president of the American Academy of Podiatric Sports Medicine. He's going to uh, give a little bit of the impetus of what started the book and then take us from the sort of form thrust of the evolution of foot pathology, but he discusses the differences between, and he'll, he'll expand on this, why we are bipedal from comparing us to humans to primates, and then all the uh, associated uh, pathologies that are, this, are linked to the setup of the progression of how the foot changes over chronology. So without further ado, thank you, Doug, for being here, and thank you for the students for, for helping me. So take it away, Doug. Tell, tell us a little bit about the intro. and. <laughs> Well, what, my what pleasure, Ben, and thank you for those kind words. And um, it, uh, it, it this has been a labor of love, and it's it's certainly I really appreciate you giving me the platform here to kind of share what went into the book and maybe open up for some discussion. We're going to do question and answer. Are we going to at the end, Ben? Uh, yeah, we're going to okay. do about forty-five to fifty minutes, and then Q and A. Okay, and and this is not a lecture. I'm just going to give an introduction, then I'm going to turn it back over to Ben and let him take it from there. But I thought it'd be good to just give a background of um, uh, the, the impetus for this, which will make everything make sense if you just bear with me. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring a, uh, a lecture up here. So can you see that, Ben? Yeah. Okay. Um, let me move this over. Okay, and we'll move this up. Okay, so you see the book? Yes. Okay, so that's the book. Uh, it was published by Springer Nature. Um, it was actually published in uh, December last year, so we're in our sixth month. But um, if you uh, want to see a copy or get a copy of it or preview it, you just go to the springer.com website. You can either type in my name <clears throat> uh, on, on their search bar or the title of the book, which is Pathomechanics of Common Foot Disorders, and it'll take you right to that page. So yeah, this is great. He just mentioned Serafian's book. I, it's even be mentioned with uh, his name is a, a true honor because I'm just a huge fan of Serafian's work and it was a big uh, uh, impetus for me uh, it, to not only write the book, but it, it was a um, it, it was a foundation really as I'm about to show you because Serafian um, is an anatomist and a surgeon. And I really think 
uh, we all as surgeons or, or clinicians treating the foot and ankle, it wouldn't hurt for any of us to go back and, and study anatomy. And if we did reading Serafian's description of the anatomy is just a, an experience in itself. And, and truly this is in my mind, one of the best biomechanics texts of, on the foot and ankle ever written. Uh, people always ask me, what's the best biomechanics text? I really think Serafian does a better job almost in this than any other text there is uh, even before this time. Um, it was an article actually though that Serafian wrote, uh, this is back in 1987 on the behavior of the plantar fascia with loading um, that caught my eye. And in this article, he mentions a, an anatomist from Ireland uh, back in the forties named McConnell. And he talks about this, this phenomenon of the human foot called the twisted plate mechanism, which I had never heard before. And Serapian showed how the plantar fascia is part of a truss mechanism that holds up the arch of the foot. But he then brought to light a whole other mechanism operating within the foot called the twisted plate, which I had never heard before. And um, he basically showed that the human foot is unique and that the talus and the calcaneus are oriented in a vertical plane and the remainder of the foot, the metatarsals and the midfoot bones are oriented in the horizontal plane. And it, this becomes very important both from a comparative anatomy standpoint as well as a functional standpoint. So this is a unique relationship that nobody had ever described to me where we have the rear foot bones oriented uh, perpendicular and then across the midfoot joints, there's a twist in the plate of bones where the metatarsals lie on the ground in the same plane. <clears throat> this is important because if we compare the unique features of the human foot to all other primate feet, we quickly see that only the human foot has the osseous configuration of a twisted plate. And indeed, if the critical thing is the rear foot, uh, the, the chimpanzee, the, the great ape, the talus and the calcaneus lie almost next to each other. Uh, they lie in the same horizontal plane as the metatarsals. So the foot plate, as we call it, is all one flat plate of bone. And the interesting part of this is with the talus twisted or oriented so uh, medial to the calcaneus, look at the subtalar joint. It's actually oriented vertically. It's not orient, oriented horizontally as it is in the human foot. And this facilitates extreme ranges of motion of inversion and eversion for the chimpanzee for grasping. As we move the talus over the calcaneus, we lose that, tr that uh, transverse and frontal plane motion in favor of sagittal plane motion for uh, walking and running. In my book, I go through the ontogeny of the human foot and it's interesting to see that in uh, at about six weeks, the human embryo shows a flat plate of bones, much like a chimpanzee or other primates. And almost miraculously in about two weeks, the eight week embryo shows a twist has now occurred where the calcaneus slides under the talus and the talus and the calcaneus are vertical and the metatarsals remain horizontal. And this is a, uh, uh, a phenomenal change in the em embryonic development of the human that has profound implications later in how the human foot functions compared to other primates. As you know, and we did learn this in school or should have, the development of the human foot is quite interesting uh, in the embryo and even in the, the first two years of life uh, in the fetus, the foot moves from a very supinated position to a pronated position particularly across the forefoot. And I bring this out repeatedly in the book. These changes are brought about by a three-dimensional change of the head and neck of the talus, moving the tail head and neck from a very adducted position to a, uh, a more sagittal orientation of the long axis of the calcaneus. And then there's this unique torsion that occurs within the talus um, that actually happens after birth from the five month old fetus to the adult, which is really a 12 year old child is a fully mature adult foot. The talus moves from a supinated neck to a pronated neck. And this pronates the forefoot on the rear foot. Again, a very unique human feature compared to other primates. 
And so we see the foot moving from a supinated forefoot to a pronated forefoot. That's a, an evolutionary advance. And it's something I emphasize clinically is that the unique feature of the human foot for stability is a pronated forefoot on the rear foot. And I bring this out over and over in the book. The other unique feature of the human foot compared to other primates is the stability across the mid tarsal joint or the midfoot joints. The human foot is unique in that the cuboid is elevated off of the supported surface. In all other primates, the midfoot bones rest on the supportive surface. Therefore, most uh, primates other than humans, they don't actually heel strike, they land on the midfoot and the heel doesn't come onto the ground until late mid stance. And of course, there's no stability and no arch mechanism operating in their feet. So when we compare humans to other primates, the human arch is elevated off the substrate, which not only gives a mechanical advantage for stability and propulsion, but it facilitates a very important muscle action in the foot with the peroneus longus. It's interesting, I, I found all these articles, you know, they've done gait analysis of chimpanzees walking and other primates, and they show dramatically this midfoot break in the chimpanzee in the top uh, photos. But we will see humans also develop a midfoot break as they get a flat foot deformity, particularly posterior tibial tendon dysfunction. And when we ask patients of our own that have suffered a rupture of the PT tendon in the spring ligament, we have them do a single foot heel raise and we see a midfoot break, just like a primate foot. The adult acquired flat foot actually deteriorates over time to become a chimpanzee foot. The way the bones move and the way the foot functions is just like a chimpanzee foot, which is relatively dysfunctional. The locking of the midfoot uh, in the human is really built upon the calcaneocuboid joint, not the medial column of the foot. This was brought to light by Finn Bojan Moeller, who studied the comparative anatomy of humans and other primates. And he was able to find that the key difference in stability of the midfoot came from the calcaneocuboid joint. If we look laterally, what elevates this cuboid off of the ground supportive surface is a series of ligaments be between the calcaneus and the cuboid, and then the all important long plantar ligament. The tension in the long plantar ligament elevating the lateral arch is akin to the plantar fascia and the truss mechanism of the medial longitudinal arch. There's that long plantar ligament, which probably is the second most important ligament in the human foot compared to the plantar fascia, and is extremely important for transferring load to the medial column during the walking gait cycle. So Bosch and Moeller really was the guy who brought all of this to light, even though other authors had talked about the comparative anatomy of the calcaneocuboid joint. It was Bosch and Moeller who looked really closely here and described it elegantly. And I went over this in my book, and I, th this is a quote from Bojan Moeller, which I'm not going to go into, but he shows an osseous locking of the cuboid to the calcaneus in the human CC joint, whereas in the other primates, it's a flat ovoid, a very mobile joint. It has no ability for osseous locking or stability. And so Bojan Moeller went further and he said this osseous locking requires pronation of the forefoot on the rear foot. And that fits into this whole ontogeny and development of the human foot, making it unique to other primates. It's the pronation of the forefoot on the rear foot, the rotation of the forefoot on the rear foot and the direction of pronation that locks the calcaneocuboid joint and provides stability during gait. And this locking of the calcaneocuboid joint engages the peroneus longus to actually effectively initiate pronation of the forefoot further. And so bringing this back just clinically to the twisted plate, Serafian showed, and it's true in any foot you look at, that as we twist the plate, we, we establish the arches of the foot. And as I've done with this plate of uh, carbon fiber material, 
by twisting the plate, just like the bones of the foot, you can see I've established a medial longitudinal arch. And you can see this lateral arch also peaking off the ground. And how did I do that? Well, I twisted the rear foot, which is the back part of the plate in the direction of inversion. We are all, all taught that in school. We invert the rear foot and it raises the arch and it makes the foot more stable. But we can also twist the plate by everting the forefoot. You get the exact same effect. So this is something clinicians don't look at. Everybody thinks the rear foot controls the forefoot, but in reality, and as I show in great detail in the book, the forefoot controls the rear foot. It has a mechanical advantage of much more surface area of contact on the ground with all five metatarsals compared to the very narrow surface contact of the uh, narrow calcaneal tuber. So if we wanna enhance stability to the arches of the foot, we wanna evert or pronate the forefoot. That goes right along with the ontogeny of the human foot that differentiated it and made it superior to other primate feet for propulsion. <clears throat> so inversion of the rear foot or eversion of the forefoot twist the foot plate, which is also known as the lamina pedis. These motions are strongly coupled and they don't occur independently in the weight bearing foot. If you supinate the rear foot, the forefoot automatically pronates. If you pronate the rear foot, the forefoot automatically supinates to remain on the ground. So this is what Serafian showed, this supination of the rear foot coupled with pronation of the forefoot. And it's hard to get the three-dimensional picture of this, but this is such an elegant mechanism, the way these bones twist upon each other. And they twist in a uniform way because of these all-important ligaments. Without the ligaments, you don't have the twisted plate configuration and you don't have the movement transfer. And as I show in the book, when we twist the plate favorably, it seems to do everything we try to do with foot orthoses. It raises the medial longitudinal arch, it plantar flexes the first ray, it decreases tension on the plantar fascia, and it improves range of motion across the first MTP. Those are all things we strive to do with our patients in almost every foot orthotic application. So this is that unique twisting of the foot plate when it's flat on the ground that is reproduced in every patient you see, but you may not really be looking at it. One thing for sure, the foot is not a rigid body that rotates only in one plane. It doesn't just invert like a stiff board from medial to lateral. It, that, that isn't the way the foot works. The foot plate is connected with ligaments and twisted upon itself and the movements are unique as we further twist. And what's really important is it's all coupled to the tibia and the fibula. As the leg externally rotates, it twists the talus external. And as it twists the talus external, it pronates the forefoot. They're all coupled together. You can supinate the forefoot and you'll get a retrograde internal rotation of the tibia and internal rotation of the talus. Okay, and so just to drive that home, um, you know, I showed this in the book and I wish I could have shown a video because I still don't think you can appreciate the, the three-dimensional aspect of that. So I'm gonna show you a video I made with a cadaver. Um, and this is pretty amazing. I, I just took a cadaver and I, I removed the integument off the medial aspect. And what I'm gonna do is I'm, uh, you can't see, but I, I'm grabbing the, the leg of the cadaver and I'm gonna just internally and externally rotate the leg, the lower leg, so you can see the movement transfer within the foot, okay? And isn't that fascinating to look at that? Um, this is the talus here. This is the talonavicular joint, which is the most mobile joint in the foot. It moves threefold greater magnitude than the subtalar joint, which is back here. This is the posterior facet of the subtalar joint. But how, how can you describe this three-dimensional motion? It's so uh, interesting, you know, and we're starting to learn it as we look at three-dimensional 
uh, CT scans now with curved beam technology, we can now look at each of these joints and watch as they rotate as the foot pronates and supinates. But this is movement within the foot of pronation, and now we're going to supinate the foot only by internally and externally rotating the tibia. But the foot does not lift off the ground like a flat board. It stays on the ground because of the simultaneous pronation of the forefoot as the rear foot supinates. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay. So um, let's see, I'm gonna show one more. Uh, bear with me here. I got one more. I, I put some markers on um, this cadaver. And this is the medial malleolus. And as it is internally and externally rotating, this is the navicular. Okay, again, that's a twisted plate delivery of motion from the tibia into the foot itself, which is what happens with each step we take. So with that, I'm gonna throw that back to Ben. Um, I hope you enjoyed that, Ben. We were talking about this the other day and I started realizing I gotta show him this video. and. Um, I'm gonna stop screen sharing. So happy to let you take over. Yeah, it's it, that was a great illustration. So based on the twisted plate theory, I don't wanna to get too ahead because we're gonna be talking about at least a couple common things like plantar fasciitis and neuromas and some of the things that you learned anatomically that are responsible for these things. And you, you went into extensive descriptions of debunking some of uh, the things that we commonly associate with fasciitis, but getting back to the twisted plate, what do, you what do you think the points where that goes wrong that set up foot pathology? What are the main things, like for instance, too tight of a, a long plantar ligament, uh, laxity in the subtalar joint? What are the, what are the principal things? We, you've, you mentioned that Everybody talks about Aquinas, but in your opinion, that's kind of overplayed. From yes. the standpoint of the twisted plate, where do, th where do things go wrong that either make too much of a Pez Cavus foot, which can has its host of problems, i.e. a submet five callus or a, or a submet one uh, sesamoiditis, uh, or as you mentioned, the, the acquired uh, adult flat foot. Maybe take us through, if it, if it goes back to, to that point with the twisted plate, where, where things go wrong. Yeah, that's a great uh, segue. Um, well, the canvas foot is an over twisted plate. Uh, I mean, you can over correct a foot and a canvas foot, that's a great, a great analogy. That's an over twisted plate. When the talus moved on top of the calcaneus in our ontogeny, it placed the ankle joint in a very precarious position in the human foot. In chimpanzees, the calcaneus lies next to the talus and the chimp will bear weight simultaneously on both the talus and the calcaneus and the fibula because they're all flat on the ground. But now we bring this talus up on top of the calcaneus. And if we over twist the forefoot, you know, if you over pronate the forefoot with a plantar flex first ray, you create a forefoot valgus that automatically inverts the rear foot and that patient is vulnerable to an ankle sprain. Uh, the ankle sprain is probably the bane of the uh, athlete's existence. It's the most common injury in sport, uh, whether it's lower extremity or upper extremity. And it's there and it's, we sprain it because of the sacrifice we made in our development for forward mobility. That movement of the, or that reposition the talus on top of the calcaneus facilitates excellent forward sagittal plane movement of the ankle, but it makes it vulnerable to inversion injury that is induced by forefoot deformity. There are many studies showing that cavus feet have a high predilection for uh, lateral ankle sprains and uh, perineal uh, tendon pathology, simply because of the constant strain on the perineal tendons. And now the opposite you mentioned is the flat foot. The flat foot is an untwisted plate. And understanding the twisted plate allows us how to use orthotics or even surgery to correct a flat foot. Um, 
we really should immediately think in current terms of correcting flat foot of trying to pronate the forefoot on the rear foot. And there are ways to do that with a foot orthosis by putting a lateral wedge across the weight bearing surface of the metatarsals to facilitate pronation of the forefoot. <clears throat> Surgically, the, the, um, uh, there are certain osteotomy procedures on the medial column to plantar flex the medial column and or to um, uh, uh, arthrodes the medial column. And when we arthrodes and plantar flex the medial column, we're following the twisted plate theory of pronating the forefoot on the rear foot. Um, we've learned that the best surgical procedures to correct flat foot follow the twisted plate mechanism. Um, it doesn't do a lot of good to do a medial calcaneal slide osteotomy alone on a flat foot deformity, because unless you address the forefoot supination that dominates the flat foot, you're gonna fail. You're gonna fail with your foot orthotic and you're gonna fail with the um, surgery. And like you and I talked the other day, the idea of putting a forefoot varus post on a flat foot deformity really tends to invert the forefoot more. It tends to supinate the forefoot and elevate the first ray, which is counterintuitive on how we correct a flat foot now with our knowledge. We shouldn't be putting a varus post under the forefoot. We shouldn't do that for plantar fasciitis, and we definitely shouldn't do it for a flat foot deformity. Back to the ankle sprains, because I know that you've, of course, have worked a lot with bracing, and I presume it was with uh, your main objectives with bracing were stability of the, the subtail or the ankle, and then helping with drop foot with uh, the dorsiflex assist that you uh, developed with, with your Ritchie brace, but also with medial and lateral stability. I wanted to, so that the students can relate uh, to this. Of course, you've talked so much about things like um, single-legged stance for, for developing better stability. Um, I know that I, I think it was Rich Boucher that talked about the, the hopscotch test of, of just being able to, to move and, and leave the ground and then, and then uh, come to stability, descending, ascending, stereotype things. One of the things that I was talking about with the trainer, and this might get a little bit back to thinking outside of just the frontal plane with, with, uh, with regards to ankle stability and Pez Cavus is he mentioned just doing squats, and it doesn't even have to be a single um, leg squat, but just doing squats, that upward thrust of being very important with ankle st uh, stability. How does that relate to you? Does that make sense to you? What do you um, Yeah, absolutely. You know, we know that patients with chronic ankle instability have a total disconnect between uh, muscle activation, and it really goes up to the higher brain centers but they don't have motor control over their ankle. They're, they're short circuited through their neuromuscular system. And so these weight bearing exercises with dynamic motion, whether it's squats, uh, even jump landings are designed to reestablish the neural connect in connections between the brain and, and the muscles of the lower extremity. So they fire in their correct order it, 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 to, to oversimplify it. And because they're all out of whack. It's really weird, but this happens after ACL injuries and it happens after an ankle sprain. Um, in terms of bracing, what we found early on when we did some kinematic studies with my brace at the University of Massachusetts with flat foot, and we found that what the brace was doing was controlling rotation of the lower leg. It was controlling excessive internal rotation in flat feet and excessive external rotation in the case of an ankle sprain. Um, you can't sprain your ankle unless the tibia and fibula externally rotate. I mean, that's coupled with the inversion. And everybody always tries to prevent ankle sprains by everting the foot, you know, taping the foot maximally pronated. I know practitioners put valgus wedges under the heel and the forefoot. And, and that's, that's futile. I, I, I could argue all that does is mess up the normal kinematics of the foot. If you can control internal and external rotation, the tibiofibular unit, you can prevent an ankle sprain, in my opinion, better than any kind of wedge placed under the foot. I would agree with that. And uh, I guess you've made strides with 
having more compliant braces that people are willing to wear, we uh, have all had the patients that will, uh, particularly our, our geriatric set of people that are start, trying to stay active, that will take braces that they have not worn or, or you pretty much know that they're sitting in the closet. So going back to what you said is, is probably not the best strategy, is a lateral wedge at all a transition strategy for ankle sprains with the, with the pes cavus foot? Or you just think that that's not really, you're just confusing the, the motor firing and, and you're not really going to accomplish much with respect to, to lateral wedging? Well, I would do a lateral wedge, but I would do it only under the forefoot. Um, <clears throat> for a number of reasons. Most cabus feet have a, a forefoot valgus deformity anyway. So a lateral forefoot wedge tends to balance that uh, deformity to the supportive surface. But it also has a powerful eversion moment arm directed back to the ankle. And it also is a, uh, a wedge that comes into play during heel rise or during forefoot landing which is really the mechanism of an ankle sprain. Most ankle sprains occur when an athlete lands on their forefoot awkwardly or lands on an opponent's shoe and the heel isn't even on the ground anyway. So why are we trying to wedge the heel of these patients? Uh, and like I said, this calcaneus, the surface area of contact is so minimal, the wedge has minimal effect anyway. So I'm, I'm in big favor of wedging, but I wedge in the forefoot in most cases. One of the things that really hit home in your book when I was reading it was the skinny calcaneus against the, the relatively wide forefoot and how powerful the lever arm of the Achilles is on moving in, in the frontal plane. And yet you point out there's many other structures that are important with plantar fasciitis. Can you sort of illuminate us on some of the different things that we discussed before about plantar fasciitis, some of the misconceptions and some of the things that you discovered with plantar fasciitis, since that's such a common entity. Yeah, um, like every chapter in my book, I, I didn't say anything unless it was evidence-based, especially when it comes to plantar heel pain, because there's so much misinformation out of there. And, and at the same time, there's a lot of really good research on plantar fascia loading and the histology, uh, the risk factors, uh, epidemiologic studies. And so I just tried to put all the science together and show that there's a lot of misconceptions about it. Um, the, the first is uh, that Aquinas and the Achilles tension on the uh, calcaneus is the most profound deforming force on the plantar fascia during either standing or, or, or particularly during walking. And there's very good research. There's at least four very good kinematic studies and finite computer model studies showing that the biggest load on the plantar fascia occurs during heel rise with dorsiflexion of the hallux. The first metatarsophalangeal joint imparts 80% of the load on the plantar fascia during heel rise while the uh, Achilles provides about 20% of the load. And so, yeah, we, we, we want our athletes to stretch their heel cord and that's the cornerstone of everybody's treatment, but we're just now discovering, hey, if we can try to control ex excessive extension of the great toe joint with rocker sole shoes, with carbon fiber plates um, to kind of restrict excessive dorsiflexion of the hallux, we, we go a long way to offloading the tensile strain in the plantar fascia better than some of these other strategies we've used. Tell me about some of the strategies that you think are ill-conceived in terms of surgical strategies with res respect to plantar fasciitis. We, we talked about that before as well. And I do wanna mention one more that we didn't talk about. It has to do with the elasticity of the bone, the breakdown of the bone, bone edema, we don't often think about that in, in, in direct context to plantar fasciitis, but heel contusion or bone edema is, is sometimes part and parcel of, of heel pain. But now we have a, a, a procedure that's been um, uh, touted about where there's drilling of the, the calcaneus, the slurry of uh, the bone is, is reinserted and then packed back in. 
uh, sort of an oats procedure of, of the calcaneus, as it were. To give me some of your thoughts on, we could start there, or if you wanna start with some of the other things that you think are a rush to surgery with, with respect to other things that we, we could try, but maybe you could comment on um, sort of the idea of, of getting an MRI, having it light up hot with a bone. What does that tell you uh, about, should we be then focusing on the bone or are there other things that perhaps we're missing? Yeah, you know, it, uh, it's interesting. Uh, let, we'll just talk about the bone and the spur. You know, there's pretty good evidence now with histologic studies that that spur is not, the spur is not induced by tensile strain uh, on the, the enthesis, of, uh, which is really the insertion of the plantar fascia onto the calcaneus. It, there's good evidence that a spur grows as a protective mechanism to disperse uh, strain, um, uh, force and uh, contact on the, uh, the plantar fascia uh, enthes. Uh, the, the, the trabecular arrangement, uh, the, the trabecular pattern in a calcadial spur shows that it's not induced by traction itself. Um, it's actually a response to almost ground reaction forces and more evidence now shearing forces across the plantar fascia at its insertion on the calcaneus. And we're not sure where these shearing forces come from, let alone how to uh, try to m mitigate them. But uh, we all know that we do all these things to try to reduce tensile strain in the fascia. And a lot of these patients don't get better. Uh, we, to get to your question, yeah, we do MRIs on these patients. We see bone marrow edema. Uh, we see fasciopathy within the, uh, the enthesis and the proximal uh, insertional area. Uh, what, what is it, what is it that, that's making these patients hurt? Uh, we don't know what causes the pain of plantar fasciitis. Uh, it, we, we use the term plantar fasciitis, it's really a fasciopathy, it's a degenerative process, and it, that's not a painful process. That's a breakdown of tissue that's relatively non-painful. And we don't know why is the plantar fascia so painful uh, in these patients, particularly when they get out of bed in the morning. That, that, that's even subject to debate. Um, and then finally, what, why is it that some of these a, a subgroup of patients just never get better, you know? Um, and, and that leads to this nerve entrapment theory that in my, I brought this out a lot in the book. <clears throat> I believe sooner or later, as the fascia thickens, it's gonna doom that patient to an entrapment of the inferior calcaneal nerve, which is passing through a very tight corridor beneath the plantar fascia and up against the roof of the calcaneus. And with thickening of the fascia, which we know occurs from ultrasound studies, it can almost double in thickness, um, it's going to entrap that nerve. And once that nerve becomes entrapped, it doesn't matter what orthotic you use or what PRP or what, you know, regenerative medicine uh, interventions uh, you're going to uh, put in there. They've got a nerve entrapment now that has to be dealt with either surgically or with radiofrequency ablation or maybe some other techniques. So, what we have to do is really break down these patients into subgroups and see where they are in this. Uh, in, it may be a continuum or it may be three different pathologies that can coexist together. You know, there's a lot we don't know. And I, the, there, there's so many myths about plantar fasciitis that still get propagated today. It, it, it really amazes me because there's a lot of good literature out there to debunk most of them. So your final thoughts on the bone, is that something that you have seen research on? I don't, I, I for one don't know how much studies have been done on this, this newer technique that, that, uh, that's been gotten more popularity over the last five years of drilling into the bone and then reinserting the, uh, the bone slurry to try to get revascularization of the bone and uh, I guess remove the defective, um, inflammatory tissue, I, I suppose, in the bone is, is part of the thought process. Yeah, you know, and I, I did, uh, as you know, I didn't talk about treatment in my book, so I didn't review all of that, but I have read some of it. What the, does your gut tell you though on that one, Doug? Well, it tells me well, whenever I read these papers on new surgical techniques for plantar heel pain, it amazes me because in, in, at the end of one paragraph, they'll subtly say, and by the way, while you're in there, go ahead and cut the medial fibers of the plantar fascia away, 
from the bone. I'll bet in that technique you're describing, they resected some of the plantar fascia to get to the bone. And so they really were doing a plantar fascia release, which by the way, does eventually get rid of their pain. Uh, it decompresses the nerve and it takes the attachment away, but it completely destabilizes the foot. It's the worst thing you could do to the human foot. Uh, the biggest miracle of the human foot is the establishment of the medial truss. And the plantar aponeurosis is a structure pretty much unique to a human foot. It's not seen in any other primates. And the thought of going in and cutting it, um, it, it just baffles me. Uh, so uh, drilling out the bone, uh, maybe if there is bone marrow edema and a stress reaction in there, I could see that help. But uh, it always interests me too, because the post-op protocol for these patients is usually in a boot, maybe even non-weight bearing for four to six weeks. Well, a lot of these people get better when you put them in a boot and put them non-weight bearing for four to six weeks, right? I mean, you could do that without having to drill the bone and put expensive uh, regenerative medicine in there. I don't know how popular that is today in offices, but Scott Millay, when I was in Philly, Dr. Millay used to have people do four to six weeks before he would operate on them. And I wish that people had more of that thought process first, because like you say, you know, which, which of it is doing yeah. most of the good. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> Um, well, I think it's a good segue then to, you, you've talked about the anatomy of the fascia and maybe talk to us a little bit about some of, you, you studied this extensively, the, uh, the layout of the medial and lateral communicating uh, branches, neuromas, and some of the misconceptions about neuromas. Get a whole yeah. chapter about that. Yeah, I think it's interesting because that was probably the shortest chapter in the book because there's very little written about, believe it or not, as common as neuromas are, there's, there's not a lot of good published research on them and a lot, lot of good studies. And the studies that there are, they're, they're not really high quality. Um, and uh, it's interesting, I just saw recent banter on podiatry management online about neuromas and whether we should even re cut them out whether we should do a decompression procedure on the deep transverse metatarsal ligament, this and that. And there was all this controversy and it was very clear when you have controversy like that's because nobody really has an answer, you know, and it's all anecdotal. Um, but uh, the bottom line is we don't know. Uh, I, I pretty much outlined what I thought were pretty solid mechanisms for the common foot pathologies. But when I got to neuroma, I, I could not come to a conclusion as to what specifically causes neuromas. Uh, we, it, it is very clear it's not an entrapment underneath the deep transverse metatarsal ligament. Um, it, neuromas lie distal to that ligament. And um, uh, to go in and cut that ligament, as I show in my chapter on plantar plate injuries, it's just the worst thing you can do. The deep transverse metatarsal ligament is part of what's known as a tie bar system across the forefoot that tethers the metatarsals and the plantar plates together. And when you cut one of those, you let you destabilize the plantar plate of both adjacent joints. Uh, there's no question. And there's evidence that destabilizes the, the uh, transverse arch of the foot. Um, and finally, you're not really decompressing a nerve entrapment because that isn't what a neuroma is. So, um, I, I, I will say this, and we talked about this, Ben. I, of all the pathologies I treated with foot orthotics in my career, neuromas were the best. I, I had my best outcome. If I had a compliant patient who was willing to wear proper shoes, I'll quickly say. But orthotics work, a, a good balanced foot orthosis, balancing the forefoot to the rear foot, does something magical to uh, offload a neuroma. And I, I'm not, I, I, I can speculate why, but um, in the book, I, I basically speculated that patients who get neuromas are, are ambulating in an abnormal gait where they're, where they're doing a push off across the oblique axis, the lesser metatarsals rather than across their great toe joint, which is known as the transverse axis. This goes back to Boge and Moeller. And with excessive oblique axis propulsion across the forefoot, I believe there's some shearing mechanism across the intermetatarsal spaces and particularly peculiar to the third interspace. It begins to uh, traumatize that nerve. 
Um, and I think if we can refacilitate the mechanical function of the foot, particularly during push off to get load back to the great toe joint, uh, we can take the load off of an aroma and it can recover. And you also mentioned um, the septa of the fascia as being a potential hang up for what might cause an aroma. An another interesting thing, and, and I don't know if you had a chance to look back at it, but when there were dissections done of all comers that weren't necessarily neuromas, uh, you found that a lot of times it's not fitting like we would think about on the, 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 the classic stuff that we were taught in school, this, this big junction where there's this uh, yeah, the you know, larger diameter um, uh, nerve tissue. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that just doesn't happen. And uh, so blaming it on this peculiar communicating branch between the, the second and third plantar common digital nerve, that just hasn't been borne out with anatomic studies. But what Boja Moller showed, which really intrigued me, with his anatomic dissections is that nerve to the third interspace has to go around this, he calls it an intermuscular septum, which is created by the plantar fascia. And that <clears throat> excessive tension on the plantar fascia pulls this nerve proximal. Uh, it puts it on traction. And that makes sense to me as to why foot orthoses seem to help because if we do good foot orthotic therapy, we're going to take tension out of the plantar fascia. And Bosch and Muller makes a compelling argument how this tension creates traction on the third plantar common digital nerve through these intermuscular septa that exist in all feet, all healthy feet. I think one of the most powerful things I got out of your book is looking a little bit more globally and three-dimensionally with everything that you talked about, the struts and you know, not just looking at the fascia and the kind of the sagittal frontal, I mean, you, you really put it together nicely. Uh, one of your other passions, and, and you said maybe, uh, if not a full book, maybe a handbook, you talked about provocative tests. And I don't want to uh, take away all the thunder of people buying your great text. Talk about maybe a couple provocative tests that are underutilized in today's rush to get MRIs that you thought were, were great tests, whether it be, you know, something for the perineals or, or something that, that you like to do, not as common, obviously, as the anterior drawer sign, but something that, that you think we don't do enough of, uh, that if we did a couple of these tests, it would improve our clinical, you know, acumen with, with what's going on with the patient. Well, actually, I, I think the anterior drawer is a great example. I mean, in Europe, that is the gold standard for uh, detecting ligamentous disruption of the ankle. It's the gold standard to monitor recovery after an ankle sprain. Uh, they don't do MRIs over there. They don't need to. And for sure, stress radiography has long since been abandoned because of its lack of uh, uh, specificity and, and accuracy. Um, but one of my favorite uh, <clears throat> tests is the single foot heel rise test, uh, which we do for a quote, a ruptured posterior tibial tendon. Um, and that has become very well recognized as a great test to do. And it is a great test, but what's really amusing to me is it in no way diagnoses a ruptured posterior tibial tendon. Uh, there was a great paper out of England on patients who had had a posterior tibial tendon transfer uh, called a bridal procedure. It's done when a patient has a common perineal nerve injury and they have a drop foot. And so we detach the posterior tibial tendon and reroute it through the anterior part of the leg and, and, and insert it onto the dorsum of the foot to take over for the loss of the uh, tibialis anterior. So now this patient has no posterior tibial tendon, right? So intuitively you say, well, if I take somebody's posterior tibial tendon away, they're gonna end up with a flat foot sooner or later. Well, this study of over 30 patients over five years, none of them developed a flat foot, none of them. And every one of them could do a single foot heel rise, okay? And if we look at the kinematic studies, the posterior tibial tendon, uh, a single foot heel rise is closed kinetic chain ankle plantar flexion. And Yet a patient with, quote, PTTD, they can't do a single foot heel rise. Well, the reason they can't is they've ruptured their spring ligament. And so the long and short of this is the, the single foot heel rise is a great test 
in my mind, for a ruptured spring ligament. Because when you rupture your spring ligament, the talonavicular joint gets so much mobility that you can't get the lever action to lift the foot as itself off the ground. Instead, the foot just hinges across the midfoot joints. So that's a, a great provocative test, but for reasons other than what most people think it's done for. What, what's the nuance that you think uh, will elicit a better uh, detection of a ruptured Achilles tendon? If it's, if you don't have, like, if, if, it, if it's fresh, you have swelling, you, and it, maybe it's not a full rupture, but like a three quarter rupture. So you still have what looks like a little bit of plantar flexion available. How, how, how do you differentiate clinically in that situation? What, was your, what were some of the nuances that you, you do in, in detecting uh, that, well, that that's, type? Of that's actually a great question. Um, there was just a posting on LinkedIn, an orthopedic surgeon said, hey, I just did a telemedicine visit with a patient and I diagnosed a ruptured Achilles tendon. And he showed a video of how he, he had the patient's wife take a cell phone video. And he, you know, obviously the, the, the Thompson squeeze test is, is thought to be the gold standard. That's not always that accurate because you get a, a real edematous lower limb, a real big wide lower calf, and you can't really isolate or, or, or activate uh, that muscle. You can easily on a lean athlete. But there's another test that he did where the patient lays on their, their stomach in a, in a prone position and you ask them to plantar flex their ankle. And when they rupture their PT tendon, they almost always, I'm sorry, their Achilles tendon, they almost always lead with their big toe. They're, they're higher in their FHL, flexor halicis longus. And that, that's a really interesting telltale sign. But here's the best test. And I discovered this only about three years ago. I, I have a lecture on non-surgical uh, rehabilitation of the ruptured Achilles tendon, which is now the gold standard in Europe and everywhere else in the world. And we use a technique, it's called the, and this is not well, well known in podiatry, but it's called the ATR, ATRA, Achilles tendon resting angle. Have you ever heard of that? I haven't. It, this is a great test. You could do this with telemedicine. You have the patient lay on the ground or lay on the exam table prone, you bend both of their knees, okay, so the, the leg is now perpendicular to the table, and you look at the alignment of their foot to their leg. When they rupture their Achilles, the ruptured side automatically rests in a much more dorsiflex position. The angle between the foot and the leg, without you even touching the foot, is markedly different visually when you compare the two. It's Mark like a magic trick. That's awesome. Yeah. And it was really described by surgeons. It's a great technique. When you repair the Achilles, they say, well, how much tension do you want to do? Or how tight do you want to reoppose the torn ends of the fibers? Or how short should you make that Achilles when you repair it? Well, you have the other limb on the operating table. You, you, prep, you prep and drape it as though it's going to be operated on. And you do the Achilles tendon resting angle. And you tighten the Achilles until they both rest at the same angle. Got to make sense, right? So that's a great visual test that I think has great value, both surgically and non-surgically. Well, I knew there was a reason you were going to all these international foot and ankle conferences, Doug. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to give you the last word before we open it up for questions. Something that I didn't touch on in your book that you think is, uh, um, you know, noteworthy or, or, or to stimulate interest in it, because that's part of the reason we're here is to learn more and, and also to uh, disseminate information, you know? Well, I think, you know, as a sports podiatrist, you, you jumped right to the most common and most interesting injuries uh, in, in sports medicine. But um, the, the, my, my chapter on bunions, I think is really has the most relevance generally to foot and ankle clinicians. And uh, a big part of that chapter was looking at this myth of this frontal plane deformity that you see surgical procedures now designed to rotate the first metatarsal out of quote pronation. And I really took a lot of time in the book and showed a lot of very good published research that that's an entire myth. The first metatarsal does not pronate or evert 
in Halleck's abducto valgus deformity. In fact, it moves in the opposite direction. Uh, it independently inverts relative to the rest of the foot because that's the way the axis of the first ray is. Um, and so I showed that. And then finally, I really tried to show that we've really gained a great understanding that, that pronation, particularly of the talonavicular joint and the midfoot joints, is clearly the underlying risk factor to develop bunions. Um, uh, it, 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 uh, flat feet and pronated feet definitely have a predilection to get bunions. And there is evidence that foot orthotics can have a role here, at least in slowing down the progression of the deformity. And I show some, uh, some interesting papers that have already shown that outcome. We need more papers on that, but um, you know, it, we have good evidence now of something we always taught and always suspected, and that is foot alignment in the midfoot and rear foot is what causes a bunion. It's not all from tight fitting shoes. Well, I think I'd be remiss too to mention all the comments you had on the first ray and our ideas about, uh, for instance, doing the hoopster maneuver when you're just static standing versus what's happening kinematically. You spend a lot of time talking about that we can't really equate that to a, a so-called uh, hallux limitus. Can you expand on that a little bit before we open it up for questions? Well, that was kind of a recurring theme in the whole book is that these static measurements of range of motion, particularly, whether it's of the subtalar joint, the ankle joint is a great example to diagnose Aquinas. And then the first MTP with the hoopture, they in no way predict how that joint behaves during dynamic gait. And it's during dynamic gait that these pathologies or dysfunction occurs. And so to have a patient stand and lift their hallux off the ground, and it only comes off the ground 20 degrees and say that, oh, you have a functional hallux limitus, that's just totally misleading. Uh, in no way is predicting how that hallux moves during gait, because the studies show, as soon as that patient starts walking, they get 40 degrees of range of motion, okay? And I explain why. It's due to all these dynamic mechanisms that engage the windless mechanism, including the firing of the peroneus longus. So if anybody has any questions for Dr. Ritchie, uh, I don't see the chat bar up, but also our hosts can uh, highlight you if you have a question. I know we have some uh, students out there. Uh, we have GW students, we have some podiatry students, and we have some seasoned practitioners. So anybody with a question, please, uh, I'm going to open up the, the field for questions and um, anybody have anything that they want to ask? This is a great opportunity. And while people are sort of pontificating, I'm, I'm going to throw something a little bit more pop culture. What do you think of the carbon fly and, 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 and the carbon plates in, in like the Hocus, for instance? What What is your... Um, you, you mentioned you like the idea of rockers. I, I run in one of the Hoka Carbon Xs. I find it helps me with my uh, deficient ACL take, not, not in terms of stability per se, Doug, but in terms of taking some of the discomfort off that knee that has a little bit of a bald spot. Yeah. What are some of the uh, things that, uh, what are your, some of your opinions on that since you've spent a lot of time studying rockers and such? Well, um, I haven't, yeah, I haven't really studied, well, I, I guess I have read the literature on them. I'm very, I'm very fascinated by it all. I, I'd say that the big trend in foot and ankle biomechanics over the past five years has been studying this arch spring mechanism, this uh, energy storage and release mechanism that's so fascinating, that, that's very unique to the human foot. And the way we store energy in the ligaments and then release it during push-off. And I think, and how important the great toe joint is with that. And the running shoe companies got that. I mean, they looked at that research. You know, they have PhD biomechanists in their labs who go to these uh, conferences. <clears throat> and they all started looking at how can we facilitate energy return um, primarily through the great toe joint, although there is a windless mechanism that operates in the lesser MTPs, it's just not near as efficient. But that's really, uh, what the carbon uh, footplate uh, mechanism is. It's just a, another way to augment an already elegant energy storage and elastic recoil mechanism that operates within the human foot. Um, 
I, I, I just talked to my good friend, Chris McLean, who's a PhD biomechanist up in Canada. And he told me he has a lecture now on, yeah, th these do seem to facilitate a more uh, efficient running gait and better performance, but they've already also noted some kinematic changes that might be negative for certain people. And it, it's the old lesson in life, what looks like it's gonna be a great, uh, you know, solution for everybody well for everything good there's always a price you pay right and maybe we need to understand a little more about uh, how that affects the kinematics because it is limiting overall full range of motion the great toe joint we know that it's imparting a false uh energy recoil within the foot that isn't normally contributed by the natural system in the foot and there could be some negative side of it, but uh, for the most part, I'm very intrigued with it. And I, 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 always, I always found putting carbon foot plates in shoes of certain patients, particularly for sesamoid injuries, uh, which were so difficult to treat, and, and even for capsulitis and uh, plantar plate tears, um, you know, anecdotally it worked. And now we're seeing it being incorporated into footwear uh, where I, I think, yeah, there, there's definitely gonna be a place for it for certain patients. You know, you, you had some work that you did with integrating a sock uh, within, a, within a running shoe, so some kind of mirage of that, right? Or, or, or you were looking at that. Right. Um, I've noticed, and, and wh where I got this thought uh, from, from Ben O'Nig is that this idea of muting the vibrations that, that cause this sort of nauseoceptive pain within, let's say, the plantar fasciitis, where I can put a, uh, a sleeve on, a plantar fascial sleeve, and immediately the patient will have a slight reduction in pain if, if they're gonna to respond to it, not everybody does. But to me, it's like a great add-on. What were some of the things that, that you've taken from your study with uh, compression on joints and compression on soft tissue pockets that you think might be something to advance how we're treating um, sports medicine situations and, and just everyday ambulators? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I, you know, I've, I've, you know, my whole career, uh, both as a clinician and teacher, uh, read everything there was trying to understand how foot orthoses worked. And it was so frustrating. And Ben O'Neig was really one of the first to show us that everything we thought a foot orthotic was supposed to do, didn't do. And uh, that's when he came out with this uh, tuning uh, uh, paradigm with, uh, with um, <clears throat> a preferred movement pathway. And he started looking, what he's really looking at is the uh, neuromotor system, the sensory motor system that foot orthotics must and, and footwear somehow tunes the athlete to the, and, and connects them to the supportive surface, uh, hopefully in a positive way. And then we started getting more and more evidence that foot orthoses somehow affected proprioception and nociception, but both uh, sensory feedback in a positive and negative way. In a positive way, maybe to activate muscles favorably, um, uh, maybe to negate pain, but also maybe to take away essential receptors uh, that we might need. We know we can over cushion an orthotic and a running shoe to actually compromise the athlete's own proprioception, uh, you know, a feeling of, of their foot on the ground. So uh, that's really where some, a lot of this research is going. And, and I too, you know, when Dave Higgins showed me that, that FS6 sock, and he's one of my best friends, I started laughing. I said, this isn't gonna do anything. And he said, well, just try it. He goes, put it on some patients. And I did, and the same response. Uh, Nine out of 10 said, I feel better already. Um, now, of course you say, well, it's, it's a placebo. I could put any sock on, but no, if I did enough of them, there was definitely a positive treatment effect there. And, and lo and behold, that has been a very successful uh, intervention. Um, you know, Dave thinks it's because of the compression, uh, which uh, might reduce edema, which then reduces pain. But the response is so immediate. I think it's neurologic. I think it, 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 it's some comforting effect on those highly like active, swaddling a baby almost there you go so i describe yeah. it sometimes yeah yeah and, and i think we need to pay attention to that as we go forward with developing 
foot orthoses and shoes is how we can further enhance that because that that was a real eye opener for me and, and still is. You know, it was interesting when we had our, our conversation in prep with this and I was talking about how I had developed, you know, the splint for hallux limitus and for turf toe. And what you mentioned that was interesting because I had it, uh, let's just say lightly tested at a biomechanics lab with, you know, N of one, one patient that was a, a physical therapist. And the result was a 30% decrease in ground reactive force. And you immediately asked me, well, by what measure? You know, was it, you know, sensor plates? What, what, what was the mechanism that they measured? And that's, that is important, but then that creates a whole nother layer of questions uh, to be answered. You came back at me, why don't you just run a 15 case series with a VAST score and some kind of functional assessment? And I, I've already started. I've got my first two <laughs> logged in. So I'm going to have that 15 patient case series and I will uh, send it over to, to your evaluation. I guess I'll have to have them sign it to, to, <laughs> to have some kind of authenticity, but we, I am going to move forward and, and try to submit that for publication. Good idea. So, but, but what I got from you and, and, and that's been part of the collaboration I've had with, with Dave who joined the room here is that the feedback from the patient is, is very important, you know, whether it be, it feels too high on, you know, the outside of it, or it's too tight, or it's too much within the arch, you know, if it's an orthotic, I think that is so critical, because if we don't have that uh, buy-in from how they accept it, we're not going to have the compliance. Yeah, that's, that's true. And it, it was a lesson we've all learned treating these athletes with you know, you make what you think is a perfect orthotic for a patient with plantar heel pain. They come in and they throw it at you. They say it made my heel pain worse. And you're going, geez, what? I don't get it. That worked well for the patient, you know, yesterday, but why is it failing today? And, you know, there, there are just things we're not, we still don't fully understand. And the bottom line is we have to listen to the patient because their experience with something is critical. And, you know, if they tell us something is working, we got to figure out why and maybe help make it work better. Same with this, something's working negative. So, um, you know, we, we still have a lot to learn about foot and ankle mechanics and pathologies. And sometimes the patients are the best source of information for us. Sorry about that. That's okay. I'm gonna put one of my, uh, my uh, guys that I work with on the spot. Uh, Aaron is out there. He's, he's somebody that Rita assigned uh, me to, and, and uh, Aaron's actually going to try to help me with this case series. And, and uh, I don't know if Tony's out there listening today too, but he's going to help me with the statistics. But Aaron, what I wanted to ask you is, you've heard some biomechanics stuff tonight. Give us a little bit of input from what you've learned in biomechanics and how it relates to some of the things that Dr. Ritchie has shared with us. If, if I could uh, have you unmute yourself and if, give me some of your thoughts and what you've processed through your biomechanics learning and how you're carrying it uh, forward with sports medicine cases and what you anticipate your, your surgical training uh, is gonna be to integrate that. Yeah, absolutely. And I really appreciate you putting this together. And uh, this was an amazing talk. Definitely learned a lot. Um, but I was trying to take some notes down throughout the whole thing. And th there's just so many different um, like pathologies in the presentations and really the biomechanics behind them. Like you said, there's so many things we still have yet to understand and why certain things work with certain patients, why certain things don't work with others. Um, I was really fascinated. I, I think a lot of times just when we're in clinic and stuff, I mean, we do things just very statically a lot of times. And when I, I'm seeing a patient, for example, like with Pes Planus or the PTDD, and um, I start to kind of wonder, like we do the heel rise tests and stuff like that and really thinking about, okay, well, so now the reason they're having the PTTD is because of the PT tendon, obviously, and then you throw in the spring ligament being maybe a more contributing factor. I think it really just opens my eyes to there's so much more I have to be thinking about more ligamentously as opposed to just the musculoskeletal um, per se. Um, so I, I think that was a very unique aspect uh, tonight as well. Um, but I, I think it all just comes back to the, the big picture that 
and and one thing I thought was really unique was the com com uh, comparison with like the primates, for example, and how our feet, the development, how that really contributes to what how our normal function is supposed to happen, the over or under rotation. It, it's it's very um, I don't know, it, it pulls everything together. I thought it was very helpful to kind of understand that. Um, you know what I might throw you... out there? I, I mentioned this uh, to Ben the other day. I said, you know, as I went through the comparative anatomy, the things that, that the human foot has that no other primate has is a plantar fascia and mm -hmm. a, an Achilles tendon. Um, and a windless mechanism and a functional first MTP to bear weight. And I went back and looked at the most common injuries of the human foot and guess what? It's all, it's those three. It's like those, those unique anatomic features that we were given end up being our biggest vulnerability. And, uh, you know, we blame everything on the Achilles and you know, everybody says Aquinas causes every foot problem known to man, but you know, the Achilles, uh, it, it's a unique structure we have, that's for sure, but it, it's what enables us to walk and run, uh, but it's not perfect and uh, it's vulnerable. And, um, <clears throat> you know, we, we have to learn how to uh, uh, facilitate its function in a better way. And we have to figure out why people rupture their Achilles, why healthy people do. And we have to figure out why people get plantar fasciitis. I, I told Ben, I said, I'm convinced that chimpanzees do not get plantar fasciitis. And, and the reason they don't get it is they don't have a plantar fascia. <laughs> that, that brings up a great point. And what I was, we, we had uh, Golden Harper not too long ago and he talked, he, he's from Ultra. So having like that, that flat uh, shoe and everything. And I wonder if like the heel rise, for example, in most of our shoes, athletic shoes could be contributing to some of those pathologies, like what's your take on that? Yeah, you know, the, that's what's really been interesting is there've been some studies done on uh, heel rise and shoes um, uh, kinematically, of course, with the whole barefoot running a minimalist uh, controversy or fad, but looking at the Achilles alone, you know, intuitively we put the lift, we put the rise in the heel to quote, protect the Achilles uh, and also add some cushioning. But it turns out from the work they've done in Australia, when you put a, a one centimeter uh, heel rise in a shoe and compare it to an athlete running barefoot, there's more strain in the Achilles in the shoe with the heel rise than when they run barefoot, more strain. And it's like, it's counterintuitive. When you put any kind of heel lift under the heel of a human, in a shoe, it automatically increases ground reaction forces in the calcaneus. And as you elevate the heel to a certain level, it increases muscular activity in the gastroc, creating more tension in the Achilles. And then finally, just from a, a, a passive dynamic loading, offloading and elastic recoil for energy return, the more you elevate the heel in the shoe, the more slack you put on the Achilles and therefore the less you know, you're compromising that natural, you know, stretch recoil uh, re uh, mechanism. So, um, you know, we're learning a lot of these things that we thought intuitively were beneficial for the runner actually may not be, especially in my mind with putting heel lifts in shoes. I, I have a whole lecture on that. That's the worst thing you can do for an athlete with plantar heel pain because there are studies showing it increases uh, uh, strain tensile strain in the plantar fascia when you put a heel lift in and it increases ground reaction forces directly on the bone. The, and that bone is sore, as Ben mentioned, for reasons we don't know, but you don't want to increase uh, ground reaction force on an injured bone, sorry. And I didn't want to add too much confusion so that you could get the main points of uh, your book across but that, I've heard some of the same arguments on ground reactive force in, um, with respect to loading up, inverting uh, the leg and, and actually adding more ground reactive force with medial wedges to the medial compartment of the knee. I think I've, I've looked at some, some um, literature that was talking about that as well. 
yeah. that, that our intuition to sort of, uh, as, as, as you put it, I guess, succinctly, the, the best way is to three-dimensionally look at, at the structure of the underside of the foot versus concentrating on the inversion, eversion aspects in the frontal plane um, in addressing some of these pathologies. I will say though, that from personal experience, I think it's very important to introduce vari variability in your training. So for instance, if I'm, you know, and I have a sore left knee from, from an ACL deficiency and, and a, a partial meniscectomy, when I run on grass and undulating surfaces, it feels pretty good. I can actually play soccer sometimes where I'm, you know, running sideways and running backwards a little easier than running the concrete with the same repetition running. So I think it's, for me, I'm always trying to vary what I do. I don't try to run every day. I don't try to play soccer now necessarily two days in a row because of the intensity of being on, on turf. Uh, but I also look to vary from like an Adidas boost to um, you know the Hoka Carbon X for reasons that you mentioned, Doug, where we may be doing other things to our body if we're not um, introducing some different motor patterns um, right. into what we're doing. Right. Yeah, and as I told you, I didn't review any uh, literature or d discuss knee mechanics or foot orthotic therapy at all in there, but I'm well aware of what you're sharing and. Um, it's still uh, like with everything, it, it's somewhat of an enigma why some patients do better with medial wedging and some don't. And we know with medial compartment OA of the knee, generally lateral wedging does offload the medial compartment, you know, and it makes sense. It's just a, a direct mechanical effect, but you know, you laterally wedge the shoe or the foot, that's not real healthy for the foot itself in terms of its normal mechanics. So. You, you pay the price elsewhere, but if you got a really bad arthritic medial knee and the patient can have surgery, lateral wedging has been shown to be effective, no question. Where do you see, you mentioned some stuff with 3D scans um, coming more into favor, like live 3D CTs and so forth. Yeah. Where do you see, uh, it looks like your book is kind of a beacon to the future of how we look at things more in three dimensions as opposed to more uh, looking at, you know, frontal plane motion, for instance, where do you, you see know, I, the future of, of things going with um, biomechanics training uh, and implementation with new forms of intervention with, um, let's say, conservative things that we can do, running shoes, orthotics, braces? Well, you know, I just uh, attended virtually the IFAB conference, International Foot and Ankle Biomechanics conference. That's the conference of all the academic researchers all over the world interested in all aspects of foot and ankle function. And it was held in Sao Paulo, Brazil. But they had a whole, they had two full sessions on weight bearing CT with at least 10 papers, original papers. And it was, it blew my mind. It was, it was so exciting to see what you can see with three-dimensional weight bearing CT and how these individual bone segments rotate and displace relative to each other. And they showed the relevance of this to hallux valgus surgery, to for sure to flat foot reconstructive surgery. And even the changes that occur in the foot and ankle after total ankle joint replacement using three, th 3D, um, it's called curve beam imaging. I'm involved in a research project now at the Ohio School where we're looking at the frontal plane rotation of the first metatarsal in patients with hallux valgus to really drive home my part of my book where it's showing exactly how those bones move. But when you understand how these bones move, you get a much better idea of how to fix it, um, whether it's surgically or even with rehab and even with foot orthotics. And so we're on the edge of a, a real boom in understanding over the next two or three years that may change a lot of the surgical procedures we do and a lot of the uh, theories of how the foot functions. And in my mind, it's gonna verify everything these brilliant anatomists said 50 to 80 years ago about the whole twisted plate mechanism of the foot. Uh, everything I've seen and saw in that conference was absolutely verified the twisted plate rotation. 
So um, we have a lot of bio, um, well, potential uh, bioengineering students from GW. And I'm gonna ask, uh, well, for one thing, I wanna plug uh, the conference that uh, Adam Snyder uh, is putting together which is a, a healthcare uh, summit where I guess he's going to ha uh, have the preceding Surgeon General. And then, Doug, you're going to be on a, a panel with me where we look at uh, the development of an idea. In your case, you had uh, brought to great success your, your Richie Brace and, and some, uh, some diabetic socks you did with Dave Higgins and I guess some, probably some other things along the way. Um, you're going to be taking a look uh, in, in kind of real time what I'm doing with my project. And then there'll be some other interesting uh, healthcare uh, practitioners that are going to be speaking. Adam, do you want to say a couple words about that? Yeah, I think there. Uh, thank you so much for uh, bringing up the topic. The health summit, we're going to have more information about that coming soon. I, I could send out a flyer about that. Um, in addition to that, one of our really awesome speakers that we're going to be having is the current uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Tanzania. And it's going to be a really good opportunity to ask um, different speakers questions, learn about different fields of medicine, um, health and equity, diversity and inclusion, mental health, physical health, sexual health, etc. With many very prominent speakers such as Dr. Pro and uh, Dr. Ritchie. Great. I'm looking forward to doing it. And uh, Dr. Ritchie's going to have one of his colleagues that um, that developed a uh, uh, what's what's the wedge that uh, it's called Doug? <coughs> no, it, it's the STS casting. Sock. Yeah, STS casting. That's right. That's right. right. Yeah, which I've used. Now, now I, I I will say I scan virtually. What do you think of virtual casting? Oh, I think it's the way of the future. It, it's it's going to make the STS sock obsolete. But I didn't tell Richard that. That's why I brought him <laughs> on the show. <laughs> Well, listen, you know, uh, this is an irony of ironies. You are only the second book review uh, person that I've had uh, on this Fit Foot You thing that I've done. And now, now I'm collaborating with the, the GW students. And the only one guy that I've ever done a, uh, that was releasing a book was Gary Hall Sr., a former uh, Olympian. And you swam with him as, as in middle school, I guess. Yes, I Isn't did. Isn't that something? It's like lightning <laughs> strikes twice within uh, within a, a month or two. So you <laughs> yeah. guys are both releasing it here in this uh, year of, of uh, the <laughs> pandemic. Yeah, you're the common thread there, Bill, or Ben. <laughs> yep, yep. And Dave is another common thread that we have. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. You recently and, and you formerly. Yep. Um, well, listen, thank you so much for sharing uh, this time. If you have other questions. Uh, Dr. Ritchie is very good about responding to um, uh, threads and uh, he's got a blog. And uh, again, I'm going to give you last word, Doug, since you're, since you're the featured guest. Anything else that you want to say to, the, to these students? We've got uh, a lot of students that are considering perhaps podiatry, perhaps biomedical engineering. Uh, I'm going to restrain my own thoughts because I, I can talk to some of these guys more frequently, but any thoughts to these young uh, visionaries in medicine of the future that you, that you would like to impart with? And I'll let that be the last word. <laughs> well, I guess it, it boils down to the science. And, uh, you know, in my case, I went back and discovered some great science that had been overlooked 50 years ago. And um, I, I, you're never going to be criticized or faulted for following good scientific theory, scientific method, um, good high quality published research. Uh, that's really should be the foundation of everything you do, whether you go into engineering or go into clinical medicine. Uh, you got to you got to trust the science. You got to love the science, and you got to promote the science. And hopefully, that's what I did with the book. Um, my email. Is, is my name, D. Ritchie Jr. at AOL. I'm also on LinkedIn and uh, Ben can always hook you up with me if you have trouble reaching me and happy to take any uh, uh, questions uh, from here on uh, via email. If you ever wanna reach out to me, I'm always accessible. So I enjoy that and encourage you to do so. Well, thank you so much, Doug. And thank you everybody for uh, participating. I think this is a great lecture and we'll throw it up on YouTube and I'll, I'll send it to you, Doug, so that you'll, you'll have it. Uh, and hopefully this will be a, uh, 
one that you can uh, have as your featured book interview, hopefully. <laughs> All right. Very much so. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Good night.